I'm really excited to introduce our first speaker. He is the founder and CEO of Operator, and uh, has spoken here at the college in the past, and he's a, a great uh, fan of Clojure, and so it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Derek Troy West. Kia ora, good morning. Um, thank you for having me at the Conge to speak about something that I'm really uh, pretty passionate about, closure and building things with closure. Um, as Alex mentioned, I run a company called Operator and we build the very best tooling in the world for Apache Kafka. Um, and we build that tooling in closure and closure script. Um, and we have quite a lot of success in how we build it. And we think closure is a phenomenal language for product development, hence a talk, follow the data. I'd like you to keep that exhortation in mind as we, we run through the slides. Product development in closure. <clears throat> now I have something slightly awkward to do before we start because I was talking to my wife about coming to America and um, how do you all feel about a little bit of hooting and hollering? Is that something? Yeah, yeah? okay, all right. Thank goodness for that because I'm quite committed to it. I've got, it's actually a slide that I've got in there. So um, my partner and COO, uh, Kylie, in our company, she has a big experience in, in event um, management. And we have an enormous respect for the people that put on events like this. They organize them. Alex Miller, Kim Foster have done a phenomenal job in getting us all to this point. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But just don't, Americans, calm, calm, be calm yourselves. There's a slide, right? So uh, one second. And also, um, the event crew here at, uh, at um, Durham Convention uh, Center who are going to take us through the next two and a half days. So if I were to ask you, everybody at the Closure Conj, um, how excited are you to be kicking off this year's Conj, you would respond? <laughs> that's not too bad. That's about the equivalent of telling a primary school in Australia that they can play cricket at lunchtime. So that's, uh, yeah, you've, done, you've done okay. So what do I want to talk to you about today? Um, I want to start, well, I want to roll through five things, basically. I want to start with a question that we often hear in our community. Uh, what is closure for? Right? We'll start with a really big question for the first, uh, second slide of the closure, closure Conj. Secondly, I want to introduce you to something that we think is pretty interesting. What is changing in our world? And um, I, strictly, I mean the world of software development. Um, not your political system, which seems to be exploding at the moment. I didn't touch it. It had literally, I, sw I just flew in a few days ago. It had nothing to do with me. Um, why is that change exciting for closure? Uh, what problem does our product solve, which is related to that, uh, that change? And then let's enumerate some of the reasons that closure makes operator really great. Uh, the things I want you to take away from today are some uh, shared enthusiasm. I know we've got some people at the Conj who are really deeply experienced in delivering stuff with Clojure, and a lot of things I'm going to talk about has probably occurred to you. But we've also got some people at the Conj uh, who are new to this world, and they kind of want to understand um, what they can get out of Clojure. And, and for me, I stumbled on Clojure eight years ago after a, more than a decade of enterprise Java development. And the thing that I got from Clojure personally um, the most was just a real kick in the pants, and I needed it because I had lost my curiosity <clears throat> at that time. And Clojure returned that to me, and I'll be forever grateful for that. Um, so I want to share some of that enthusiasm with you today, and some shared experience, because as a small business owner, the thing that Clojure gives us that's the single most important thing is a competitive advantage. And I want you to remember that when you're trying to talk to your colleagues in your organizations and convince them that they should use this wonderful data-oriented Lisp that runs on the JVM, you're going to run into a brick wall at some point, and um, <clears throat> when you run into that brick wall, you should just outcompete them, because isn't that what we all really want to see? Our enemies driven before us, <laughs> and hear the wails and lamentations of their programmers. It's not just me. Okay. So keep that in mind. It's not all about the joy of closure, right? It should be some aspect of the fear of your competitors using closure and you not being able to. So let's start with a big, 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 big question. What is closure for? Well, I would like to answer that question for you, but this year, um, someone has been living their best life on Twitter, and they have answered it better than I possibly ever could. 
I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Stuart Halloway, if you haven't heard from him before. He says, I use Clojure because the fastest way to implement non-trivial projects in Java is to create Clojure and then use it. <laughs> it's a bit bonkers, isn't it, really? The thing that really I find impressive about that tweet uh, is that I'm not actually even sure that he's joking. I think he's serious. Uh, my team, we don't have the ability to create languages like Clojure. We don't have to. Fortunately, the great team at Cogitech steward that language for us. But other than that, um, I, I have a real affinity with what Stuart says there because in my career so far of 20 years of um, building products for companies, I can honestly say that uh, every single system that I have ever built would have been better off being built in Clojure. Um, and, you know, that's a bit of a vacuous statement to make, really, so let's drill down and figure out why. Let's ask another really big question. We're going to get into metaphysics shortly, and then I'll just float away in a little cloud. <laughs> What's our purpose? Well, my purpose, sadly, when I'm sitting um, at the computer, um, I'm not creating art, which is probably what I'd like to do. I'm not playing games, which is probably what I'd like to waste my time doing. Um, predominantly, my career has been focused on building products. That bottom right-hand corner of the uh, selection of things that I could spend my time doing. And um, I've built products for companies all around the world, and generally um, there's a singular focus to the products that we build. We take some data, we filter it, we transform it, and we put it somewhere. And I'm quite comfortable telling you that that's every single system that I've ever built. <laughs> Now, it's true that it's really hard to get developers to focus on just building products because they're always going to try and build a framework, right? They're always going to try and build a language. That's what we want to do. We're creative, expressive people. We don't want to just build a system that sells widgets and pulls data out of somewhere and moves it somewhere else. Um, but really, the focus of everything that um, we've done over the years is building products. Um, and there's a big lie that's told to us when we're starting to learn our, our careers in software development. And that lie is that there's one way of uh, solving these problem domains, and it's object-oriented design. And so as a young developer learning Java, I came up trying to solve data-oriented problems with object-oriented design. And you can do that if you want to. That's fine. Um, it's not the most effective way of building products. But I think it's a little confusing because it is probably the best way of building frameworks, where you're trying to capture some ethereal abstract idea and give it some concretions and throw it over the wall so that people can use. I, I have no idea what you would use to build languages, um, but uh, my career has all been about shifting data around. And that's why I think I love Clojure so much, because there's a real affinity with this data-oriented language that thrives on the JVM and in the browser. And I think, mostly, um, that's your careers as well. It certainly seems to be, because this is the response to um, the, uh, the, this year's closure survey. And lots and lots of us work in financial services and enterprise software. I roll them up into one category, really. And what is that if not um, munging data while having some concerns about security and other things? So um, that brings me to the big field. And I really am sorry for this. Uh, this slide. Um, the big question, what's changing in uh, our software industry? Well, there's a sea change in the enterprise. <laughs> I think, um, don't let this be the loneliest two and a half days of my life after this. I'm really trying very hard. There's a sea change in the enterprise. And it just happens, actually, that this, this sea change is in exactly uh, my company's uh, expertise. So this is enterprise architecture, right? This is uh, the um, standard architecture for how things are built for mid-level companies around the world. There's a database. There's a Java application running. Um, it's got a UI front end to it. Uh, and that's how software has been built. And the, the, the predominance of software in the enterprise looks exactly like that. Might not have been built this year. But if, you know, there are companies carrying around software that have been in existence for 15, 20 years, all through Durham and all throughout the world. But there's a problem, you see, because enterprise concerns are changing. 
Whereas previously the enterprise was probably really, really predominantly concerned with security first and other sorts of um, constraints, every company that I talk to in Melbourne today is concerned about real-time scale and availability. And it might just be because all of these companies come and talk to us because it's our particular niche in this field in our small industry in Melbourne. But we're run off our feet by companies that have that sort of architecture and it's not real-time, it doesn't scale, and it's not highly available. And they want to know how they bridge that gap. How, that, how do they get to um, the same product delivery, but, well, let's put some meat on these bones. Real-time has some meanings for um, actual engineering, and none of them are particularly important in this case. Real-time just means that it's got some sense of happening in the now. And to give you an example, if you're a startup bank and uh, you're, you've got a customer onboarding process, there's no point telling me if my application to join the bank was successful tomorrow because in the time it's taken you to batch process that, I have signed up with your competitor, got a $20 bonus, bought myself a copy, coffee and deleted your app. So it's a, really a matter of life and death for companies today where those sorts of systems would have been built in a batch oriented way previously. Scale is a concern for every enterprise that we talk to simply because they have so much more data than they ever had in the past and they don't know how to, um, how to deal with that ingress of data at volumes higher than they've seen before. And then availability is um, a pressing concern for the same comp competitive reasons as real time, really. You have to be always on. You have to always facilitate your customers' uh, uh, demands. Uh, and also, there's a slightly different aspect to availability in that you should have a convincing story for how you're going to recover when things do inevitably go wrong. And it turns out that Im immutable time series compute is a really, really, really good way of building these systems. And that really means distributed compute. So the enterprise is moving towards distributed compute for bog standard product building all around the world, as far as I can tell. And um, what is the very best way of delivering distributed compute on the JVM uh, with a standard Java mindset? Well, luckily, there's a wonderful language that is fit perfectly for distribution, and distribution is the essence of how we achieve real-time scale and availability. It runs on the JVM, but it isn't Java. It has immutability at its heart because immutability is absolutely key for distribution. It's a functional data-oriented language. It works with sequences and maps. It's a dynamic language. It cares very little for types. We find when we're building systems in this language that it's really good to um, separate side effecting from pure functions and to push your side effecting functions to the edge. You can create really sophisticated systems from very simple tooling. Supports interop with multiple host environments. Took two and a half years to progress into an open source project. I've probably labored this gag a little bit too long. It's released in 2009. Um, and you've probably all guessed, it's Apache Kafka. <laughs> Some of you didn't guess. Rich Hickey knew, I think he knew when he released Clojure. Um, so this is the thing about Kafka, is that commonly everyone knows it as a message broker, but it really isn't. It's a programmatic model for building real-time, scalable, available, distributed compute on the JVM. And Jay Kreps, who was at LinkedIn, who um, writes a bunch of uh, phenomenal articles, is the CEO of Confluent now. I couldn't find the quote, unfortunately, for um, this talk, but I'm certain he said that their purpose when they built Kafka, the message broker, was to build a great distribu distributed immutable log that they could then leverage for distributed compute because this is a real necessity in uh, the world that we see today. And so Apache Kafka comes with a whole bunch of constraints that look wonderfully closure-ish, don't they really? Um, and it's kind of quite wonderful to me that Java developers all around the world are grabbing the Kafka Streams library, which really does support uh, all of these um, concerns and constraints, plugging it in and building systems that represent some of the best ideas in Clojure, but without really realizing it. Um, and 
that represents a massive opportunity for closure, and that's what I wanted to uh, impress upon you today, that the enterprise is changing. The way that we build systems is changing. We are moving away from mutable data stores with lossy systems, and we are moving towards immutable time series compute, and maybe it's Kafka that really pushes that out for um, companies around the world. Maybe not, but I believe that all of those constraints and all of those big, bold ideas that have been expressed through closure through the years will be representative in, in any of these systems because some of those key things about immutability, uh, functional composition, they're really necessary for distribution. So you have a choice today when you're building these modern systems for the enterprise. You can pair a framework like Kafka that's inherently data-oriented with a uh, programming language like Java that is inherently object-oriented if you want to. But you'll get much better results if you use a data-oriented language. And it's not just because there are some shallow considerances between um, the framework and the language. It really is that distributed systems don't care about your domain model. They don't care what your conception of your data is. They don't care what concretions and constructions you build on top of the raw truth of your data coming into your system. They only care about how uh, your data is located, data locality, data temporality, um, data durability, data partitioning. That's what Kafka cares about. It's the same story with Apache Cassandra and any other distributed system that gives you real-time scale and availability. So it, I, it might sadden a few people out there to hear this, but if you're plugging an ORM tool into your application today to write some data into Kafka or Cassandra, you're most likely doing it wrong because you need to orient yourself differently. Uh, and inherently, you need to understand that the products that you're building are um, data-oriented products. And what you really want is a fantastic data-oriented language. Also, we found, anyway. So, um, this is the fulcrum of how Kafka provides distributed compute to you. It's, um, this is called the consume, transform, produce idiom. And it's the idea that you can pull data off a topic, which is basically a, uh, a sequence, an immutable distributed sequence in, in Kafka. You can process them one message at a time, and you can put them onto another topic. It's an input, a computation, and an output. And uh, that just looks like a function to me. Might be a pure function, might be a side effecting function. That's the essence of functional composition. We start with this very basic element, then Kafka Streams or the Kafka Processor API starts to decorate and, and grow the capabilities of the library based on that. So they provide you functions to map, filter, reduce, and aggregate. And you end up building systems that are really topologies of computation that um, communicate with one another through uh, unbounded buffers, which I'm sure doesn't give anyone any concerns. Um, and that's how we distribute. And that's how we get no single point of failure. And that's really the essence of distributed compute via Kafka on the JVM today. So we take a problem that looks like this, this architecture problem, and we solve it by having a brand new architecture that looks like that. And every senior developer in the room will realize, I used to have a problem, and now I don't have any problems at all. That's wonderful, that is. <laughs> and we haven't even really, you know, I made these slides last night quite late. I didn't even have time to put in there the essence and depth of, um, did I mention that they're perfectly unbounded, limitless buffers? <laughs> oh, dear. So, but however, I should say, um, that uh, architecture for distribution does hold up. It does what it says on the tin. My company were working with a client uh, years ago that was processing email. Then Yahoo blew up like the Death Star. That's a, a technical financial term for their demise. They splintered. Um, and the company that I was working with, we built some systems for, all of a sudden had three orders magnitude more data to deal with. And we had built those systems, Kafka, Clojure, Cassandra, and Apache Storm at the time, which we don't use anymore. And how do we resolve that issue of three order magnitude growth in data? Within a nine month period, there was some engineering to be done. Uh, we added two Kafka machines, two Storm machines, and about 20 Cassandra boxes, because the architecture does stand up. So this is where um, Operator comes in, and I would like to give you a little bit of a demo, because Operator comes in with, uh, it, it seeks to solve this problem for developers in this space. 
you build distributed streaming compute with Kafka, you throw your applications out into the wild, and all of a sudden, you have problems that you didn't have before. You have things that you have to monitor that you didn't have to monitor before. And um, that's uh, problematic. What we used to do uh, early on, for many years, we would um, bundle something together with sticks and tweaks, maybe Riemann, maybe some monitoring, and we would get some observability over these systems. But our clients have progressed beyond that now. We can't do that anymore. We need a specialized tool. So we built it. Um, and I'm just going to show you what it looks like. In fact, it may already be running. Um, let me have a look. Here it is. I won't make it full screen because I'm going to be flipping around between um, some different odds and ends. So this is operator, and um, there's something interesting that you might notice from that very first line. You're connected to a simulated Apache Kafka cluster. It's running in your browser. So let's have a look and see what that looks like, and we'll come back and touch on that in a few minutes. Um, operator is a tool that sits close to Apache Kafka. It's written in Clojure and Clojure Script, like I mentioned earlier. It's really a straight value add by developers for developers in this space. It's just a single jar. You spin it up, and it starts snapshotting the cluster comparing snapshots, progressively computing all sorts of metrics, showing the raw snapshot data to you. We seek to just give you every single piece of data about your running system, your consumption of data off of Kafka, and everything in between that we can, in a nice little UI that some of these graphs won't mean a lot, a lot to many people in the room. But you can do things like pop in, look at a topic, look at some data. Um, transit is a first class data serialization format in um, operator for reasons that will become very obvious shortly. Uh, we can drill down into brokers, which is one dimension. We can look at topics, groups. There's a, just a plethora of data in here that we've surfaced up in this tool. The most important thing in groups, this is where we look to see how our unbounded queues are operating. The problem with uh, Kafka's own internal telemetry is there's not enough of it. So this telemetry, we don't use any of Kafka's JMX metrics. We compute all of our own. We snapshot it because we've got a wonderful data-oriented language that allows us, facilita facilitates us to do that. So we can um, create telemetry where we look at the lag of a consumer group by the group itself. We can look at it by uh, the hosts that are hosting that group, by the topics that um, that group may be trying to consume from, by the brokers that are hosting the topics that that group is trying to consume from, because in reality, these are all of the dimensions that we need to know to figure out how our system is operating. And um, that would have saved me three days of time with a client at Christmas, which is why we built, um, we built Operator. And I'd like to share with you now um, the five advantages of closure for building Operator. Number one, Datafy. It's more about the ethos than anything else, I think. Datafy, if you're not aware of it, is uh, it's a protocol that is uh, recently released, Datafiable, um, in Clojure 10, I think. And really, it's just a protocol with no implementation that's meant to be for people to grab if they're building tools, I think. But um, the intent of it is that you can pass an object to Datafy, and it will turn it into data. And if that doesn't capture the very best of Clojure, I'm not sure what does. And in our example here, I've got a function called list topics. So when you start operator, it starts up in a Java jar or a Docker container, and it immediately starts snapshotting your cluster in, uh, in a set interval. And it, it computes about, it retrieves about a dozen different snapshots. But those snapshots come back to us from the, clo uh, the Java API that we're calling as Java objects. And I, yuck, I don't want Java objects. They're no good to me. This is data, what I'm looking to do is filter, map, find the frequencies, use all of Clojure's core data functions on that data to do cool stuff to create a product. So the first thing that we do at the boundary of our system is we datafy everything. And I'd like to show you a little example of what that looks like. And to do that, first off, I'm going to have to, um, I'm going to, have to uh, start a three-node Kafka cluster running in Docker on my machine. Won't take a minute. Talk amongst yourselves or something. I think we'll... Uh... 
And at the same time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get into IntelliJ here, which is how I work with um, Cursive, and I'm going to open a REPL. And you're going to see just how difficult it is. How's that font size? Is that OK? Everyone can see that fine? We're going to start um, operator running. That looks like it's just about started to me. So um, let's start operator. It's quite straightforward, really. It's got um, one thing I do want to point out. It's got a nice little bit of ASCII art there when you start it up. <laughs> you know, child of the 80s, can't help myself really. Um, hey, it tells us it's release 17, started a local, uh, lo uh, on localhost 3000. It's connected to a particular Kafka cluster. And what you can see down here straight away, it starts snapshotting. It starts pulling out of that Kafka cluster stuff that's really valuable to us that we want to display. So um, let's have a look at what that system looks like. There it is. It's an integrant system. We use integrant, not component, because integrant is the very best method for raising data into system state on, in, in the closure world today. Um, and that system actually has a um, admin client on it. Looks a bit like that. It's a nice uh, Java object. Uh, so I'm going to use that admin client to uh, list topics, which is the function that I just showed you. And there they are. So I've made a call to a Kafka cluster via a Java interop. I've pulled back a very, very, very short um, object hierarchy at this point. I've converted into data, which is what I want. Do you know what we do with that data? We put it straight onto Kafka, because we build immutable time series compute. And then we have some streaming compute that I'll show you in a moment that computes and munges over all of that data and creates exactly the output that we need. So um, operator itself is a linearly scalable, highly available distributed system that doesn't have anything to it other than Clojure and Kafka. Um, the actual implementation of Datafy for uh, our system is a little bit broader than just that one element that I show you here. Uh, it's literally every single thing that we could possibly be pulling back from Kafka. Every interaction that we do at the boundary of our system with Kafka, we immediately drop into data because that's what we want. That's what our systems live and breathe. Um, and there's a real value to going straight to the data. And we find simulation to be absolutely categorically key for us. You might have noticed, because I told you explicitly, that um, this is a what I call a backless version of operator. I don't really know what the term is. Operator really has two parts to it, a front end and a back end. It's really super complicated. But we run operator without the back end, because the back end does the stuff where it pulls in data from Kafka, and then it computes over it and sends it to the front end. Um, so in this version, we just pretend that we'd pulled stuff in from Kafka, and we compute over it and we send it to the front end. Actually, we don't send it to the front end, you see, because there's CLJC files, but that's about two slides away, so give me a second. Um, and that allows us, as a company that builds products, to have an entirely simulated version of our product that is 100% legitimate. And this is, um, well, I'm using an, uh, a uh, uh, Leinigan alias here to run it with FigWheel. Thank you very much, Bruce Hammond, for all your hard work. Um, and uh, that's great for doing live development on the front end of our Clojure product without having to plug the back end in, which I actually, actually have plugged in anyway. I'm running them both at the same time right now. But I can look at localized 3000, uh, and there's my actual running, as if you downloaded it from Docker Hub operator, running against the Dockerized um, Kafka cluster. And I can do exactly the same things, and I can look in my metrics topic. And this time, it's not doing anything generated. It's actually pulling that data out of Kafka. But you would never know, right? Because why would you know? Because we just generate that data. And that generating that data is not particularly complicated. It looks a bit like this. There you go. That's all of the possible state that a Kafka cluster of a particular version could generate for you. And the great thing about having that facility to generate that is recently when I sent um, Operator over to a wonderful team in London who plugged it into a cluster to do some um, 
evaluation of our product. They're very kind. Uh, and they came back to me and they said uh, a day later, they said, look, Derek, this is pretty good, mate. It's pretty good. We like it. But um, look, the front end's a bit laggy, isn't it, really? And I thought to myself, well, it's not really, actually. I think it's pretty bloody good. But um, I said, chuck me a snapshot of something. Give me some stats. What are you looking at? And they sent me a screenshot. And it just turns out that their cluster was 10 times bigger than anything that I had anticipated anyone plugging it into this month. They had over 500 topics and 10 billion messages. And you know what? The, the front end was a little bit laggy at that scale, to be honest. <laughs> but, but how did I know that? Well, you see, I went into Generate, which powers the generated front end that you're looking at, and I changed the number of brokers to 50, and I changed the number of groups to 100, I changed the number of topics to 505, and that generates about 10 billion messages. And then I had a look at it, and I thought, oh, yeah, it's not too good, actually, mate. And then I fixed it and sent it back to them. And when I sent it to them, I knew what they'd come back with. And they did come back and said, thanks very much, mate. That's way better now. <laughs> it's pretty good. There's closure stuff, everybody, for a small company that's trying to knock it out of the park. I'm not even joking. It's pretty good stuff, isn't it, really? Give up on object-oriented design, everybody. Just It was always a load of old bollocks. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, advantage number three, and I've got to uh, be careful of time because I'm going to run out of it rapidly. Closure, Closure Script, and CLJC, I cannot underestimate just how valuable it is to have a phenomenal data-oriented language that works in the JVM and in the browser for a product delivery company. That problem I just described to you, how did I solve it? I moved some functions from the browser to the, from the, browser to the uh, front end. I filtered some data early, and then I changed the front end to pull rather than have everything pushed at it, which was naively what we were doing to start off with. And actually, I didn't even have to move the functions because we have come up with a bit of a strategy in our, in our world for if you're going to be side effecting in the JVM, write a closure file. If you're going to be side effecting in the browser, write a closure script file. And if you're not doing either of those things, it's a pure function, and it may as well be a CLJC file because you don't know where you want to call it from. I didn't know that we were going to be running a generated full front end for Apache Kafka in the browser when we started on the project. I just had to do a demo. And I talked, turned around to my colleague, Michal, and I said, mate, do you reckon you could knock that together? And then I went out and had a nice coffee, and then I came back, and he pretty much knocked it together. So, you know, it's good. It's good when you've, you know, got these big, broad ideas. Thanks, Stuart Sierra, for telling me to separate my, uh, fun uh, my functions at some point many years ago. Now, here's a really good advantage for you. This one's the absolute killer. Transit. My goodness gracious me. What happens to our data? This is called follow the data, right? What happens to the life of data in operator? We periodically snapshot it. You can see my little cluster here is still, it's just wildly wailing at that cluster. It's, it's wonderful. As soon as we get that data, we chuck it onto a topic. Later on, we consume that. We compute it in a streaming compute way. And I'll show you a code example, because I am going to have time for that. And we put it into a K table. Then we consume it again and put it back onto a topic. Then we consume it off that topic and we send it to the browser. We receive it in the browser and with reframe, we update some state, we generate some graphs and we show it to you. And Sente that we use for doing um, uh, the WebSockets and Kafka both support configurable serialization and deserialization and we just say that's transit, mate. And then we just forget about it. We're just working in closure data structures everywhere. And that's an enormous, um, incidental complexity, which is just taken off of our plate. It's really great. And then number five, my last phenomenal reason um, to use Clojure for product development is just straight interop. This is um, one example of interop. This is a streaming compute topology that computes metrics inside um, operator. And it's really, I'm glad we're a bootstrapped company because otherwise someone would probably complain about me just showing you that code. <laughs> You're not allowed to write it down, all right? You've got to forget it. You've got to forget you've seen it. Um, and it's basically just Java, right? But it's very closureish Java, and it's very accessible to closure. And I just can't undersell just how phenomenal that close affinity between closure and um, the JVM and the browser are for building these products. It's just given us enormous leverage to get something to market. So I want to give you something that you can take away and do some really cool stuff with. So it's not there yet, um, because I was um, panicking about this talk last night until uh, very early. But we're going to open source our um, template project for doing work like operator. 
It's just called operator-io slash shortcut. And it's those technologies which are the backbone of um, what we do uh, to build products like ours. Now, uh, the question that comes often to our community is uh, what frameworks do you use? And the truth is we don't use any. We just have a bit of closure glue that plugs them all together. So we'll just um, open source that as well. And you can see how we've plugged it together. And you're welcome to take that and just use it to your heart's content. So to recap, what is Clojure for? Well, Stuart Halloway tells us, and he's absolutely correct, it's for making stuff. But better than that, it's for making products for enterprises. And better, better than that, it's for making real-time, scalable, available products for enterprises. And that's what's changing about our world. It's an enormous, exciting opportunity. And I hope you'll all agree at the end of this talk that um, you understand that Clojure can be the heart of that change. And that's very, very, very exciting foreclosure. How good is Operator, though? It's pretty good. And it's really powered by all of those fundamental, simple, great ideas that we took from Clojure. And I just want to leave you with the thought that it's OK to build systems with data and functions first. You don't actually have to step above that. Operator has precisely zero protocols, new protocols to find. There was one called Serializable. And then Datafiable came along and made me realize that I, it was a much better name, so we deleted it, used Datafy instead. There are no def records because we use Integrant. We don't slap protocols on def records to make things seem official, do we, everybody? No. Um, we, there's no def types because I've never used one, um, but I've never used the four iron in my golf bag either. I'll keep it there. I might need it one day. Um, and it's just data and functions. And it's a sophisticated system that we're really proud of. So I'd like to say um, thank you all for having me here to talk to you today. Thank you to the team at Cognitech for your stewardship of this language and for giving it to us. Thank you to my wonderful wife, Kylie, for being the COO, inspiration, a bit, of a, a bit of a genius behind our companies. And thank you to my two beautiful kids for being wonderful. I'll see you in a few days. Thanks, and um, come and say hello. I'm here by myself, so don't leave me out there struggling. Thanks, everyone.